you know, as healthcare providers, sometimes we feel like our hands are tied because I can't go home with them to control that environment. But literally, we're kind of like just putting band-aids on stuff. And so that's why I think our whole healthcare system needs a rehaul of how are we doing? How, what are we doing? Oh, I got to go. Hey. I've been working, so them please don't hit my phone. Yeah. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Hey. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Hey. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. Hey. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. That's why I paid all my fees. I was starving for this game. Now my fan they can eat. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to the Cup of Nurses Show. Here with your hosts, Peter and Matt. We are on a mission to change this world, one conversation at a time. So let's jump right into it. But before, if you find value in this show and want to join us on this mission. Please share it and review the show. It would mean everything to us. Cupofnurses.com for all the info, all the updates, and everything you have to know about the newest releases, including the merch. For anything regarding our lifestyle podcast, check out wearefrontlinewarriors.com. In this episode, I'd like to introduce you to Alice Benjamin, better known as Nurse Alice, or America's favorite nurse. She's a cardiac clinical nurse specialist and family nurse practitioner with over 23 years of healthcare experience. Alice is also Nurse.org's clinical nursing officer and correspondent, and also hosts the popular Ask Nurse Alice podcast. Hey, Alice. Welcome to the show. Can you give us a little intro about yourself and what you do currently? So let's see. I've been a nurse collectively for 25 years now. Kind of started in the ranks as an LPN, RN with Associates, then got my bachelor's and got my master's in nursing education and clinical nurse specialist. Did that for... CNS, practice as a CNS for 13 years before I went on to do a post-master's family nurse practitioner because I got frustrated with not having prescriptive authorities. So currently I am a cardiology nurse practitioner um, doing an outpatient setting. And then I still moonlight as a critical care transport nurse, little ICU ER still on the side because I just can't let it go. Um, but as far as nursing practice, that's that's what I do when it comes to direct patient care, but I've been fortunate in that I get to wear my nursing hat in other realms. Given, given you going through all those ranks and all those levels in, a, in the nursing field, is there some aspects that you struggled with in healthcare or would change in healthcare to like, improve patient outcomes or just improve the whole process? Well, I think one of the most frustrating things um, when it came to kind of climbing the ranks is, I'll say this as kind of, as a professional development, uh, sometimes I wanted to, I had a mentor tell me this, that sometimes you want to grow and you want to do more, but it may, you may need to go into a different environment. So I thought that I was going to be the same hospital forever and just kind of, you know, stair stack and kind of grow into these different levels. But it was really hard for me to grow in areas where I had been working with people and they saw me at a particular um, level, I'll say. So like, for example, even, and I didn't say this, but I even started as a CNA, but when I was working as a CNA and I became an LVN, although I was able to get an LVN position at that place, it was hard for some of my peers to now view me in a different role. So I had to learn that sometimes when you're growing, when you're climbing that career ladder, that it's okay to go somewhere else and grow and kind of get a fresh start in your fresh role. So that was one of the things that was frustrating uh, for me, but I think collectively, um, as a provider, just seeing how our whole healthcare system is set up really sucks. Um, how our healthcare dollar is spent, a lot of it is spent on reactive care, acute emergency care, and not enough on prevention and wellness. Yet we're expected to kind of tout that information and educate people to that sense. But um, I think our healthcare system is really backwards and just messed up for lack of better words. I like how you bring that up because we have guests on that we talk about communication and we provide a lot of tertiary care, but the education part of nursing is supposed to help keep patients out of the hospital. We don't do enough to get them from being readmitted or coming to them or increasing the script. It's like a uh, an end loop that the patient feels hopeless when they get uh, put into the healthcare system. Uh, based on what uh, health condition they have. Right. And I think one of the most frustrating things about that is um, I've, you know, I've learned and I've read some studies about this, but really what we do in the hospital, in the clinics, when patients come to see us is really only 20% of um, responsible or contributory to their overall health. Really the other 80% 
are those true social determinants of health? Like uh, where they go to school, where do they live? Do they have access to fresh fruits and vegetables? Um, do they have clean air, um, clean water and those things. So, uh, you know, as healthcare providers, sometimes we feel like our hands are tied because I can't go home with them to control that environment. But literally we're kind of like just putting band-aids on stuff. And so that's why I think our whole healthcare system needs a rehaul of how are we doing, how, what are we doing? What are we doing to really keep patients out of the hospital? And uh, one of my specialties is cardiology. And so we know that heart disease, uh, atherosclerosis and all that develops really around, you know, in your, in your late teens, it starts to develop. And even if you eat healthy, don't smoke and do all those things, you're still inevitably because of your aging process mm -hmm. going to develop some. But then when you tack on the, you know, the lifestyle things like smoking and sedentary lifestyle, it exacerbates it. But we really got to look at what are we doing to really keep people healthy and well outside of the hospital. Otherwise, it's kind of like this hamster wheel. And so if I'm only, if what we're doing in the clinics and hospitals only responsible for 20%, what can we as health professionals really do to help people with that other 80%. So that's why I think that um, the future of healthcare isn't, I mean, we'll always have people in the hospital, but mm -hmm. I think the future of healthcare about how we take care of people is changing and it's going to need to change if we want to really want to make a dent in things. So what are, do you have an idea or a solution how to fill this gap? Oh gosh, if I, you know what? That is a million dollar yeah. question. Um, well, it's because like, like why I asked, asked that, it's a very tough question to ask. Why I asked that is because what I've noticed on a lot of these units is a lot of nurses complaining about certain things on the units. And when I ask them, hey, how would you change this? They don't know. There's no solution. And sometimes I ask myself this too. I complain about stuff and I'm like, how do I change this? And, and, and I don't know how to change it. So that's, that's why I'm curious if you have like an idea because a lot of people get stumped, you know? Well, I think you raise a good point because we can ask ourselves and sometimes we don't know how to change it. And this is why collaboration and working with the communities you serve is so important because we don't necessarily know how to change it. But if we ask, what can we do to help your situation? So I think part of it is really looking to see what, what's going on in these communities. What are the true barriers? What, you know, why are things the way that they are? And then you'll find out that this is really a systemic issue that's impacted by politics, education, finance, and a whole bunch of things. Um, and so it's really no simple answer with how do we get ahead and, you know, swing the pendulum to more of a preventative side, because we're just so far behind the eight ball. We literally are, but somewhere along the lines, we really have to draw a line in the sand and say, look, we got to get to the root of this problem. Otherwise we're going to run out of resources. I mean, I, I, you know, health benefits are getting more expensive. Insurance is getting more, um, in expensive, more and more people are not having insurance. And so that's going to further exacerbate the problem. And, you know, I work in, I've worked in ER, people who don't have insurance use the ER as their, their visit, you know, their, as their clinic, if you will. Um, they, they know the, the ER doctors firsthand and they come in for what could be and should be primary needs. But I think it's going to really take the healthcare community to partner with the, um, the community at large and really listen and identify, try to identify what's going on and then pulling community partners like your schools, your banks. It's going to be, it's just going to take a whole village to change that. And I don't think it's something that we can change overnight. Absolutely not. I think there are pockets of the nation and certain communities that are starting to do this work, especially since they've seen how, um, um, you know, with health disparities um, and inequity in health care, um, you know, with the pandemic, we were seeing his, um, Hispanics, Latinos, and Blacks um, die more, have severe, more severe complications from COVID. And so I think it's it shed the light on a lot of things. And so now we just have to do the follow up and continue to have those press, those conversations and, you know, pretty de demand some results. I mean, we can talk about it all day, but what are you doing? What are we doing? Where's the action? And I think we as healthcare professionals, even though we're in the hospitals and the clinics, we got to step on the gas. We got to step on the gas with some of those community partners and even our own facilities get into those communities. I've seen a lot of these large system hospitals start to develop small stand-up clinics in, you know, in these, in these communities, underserved communities. And I think, I mean, anything we can throw at this right now until we figure out what's right, I think is what's going to happen until we figure out the solution. And just to add to your point, change also starts within. So imagine if all the healthcare professionals take this responsibility, like 
if you're going to go work out, you're going to pick a trainer that looks fit and looks good. That pandemic made us turn on nurses as, as the heroes. What do we do in this situation? So imagine if we all started as nurses taking care of ourselves, feeling better, lifestyle changes where we could actually educate the patients on how well we're doing. And then also going to the community and being the preachers, because if we have a lot of credibility with the profession that we have and the things that we see. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, right. because the pandemic, when it happened, one of the worst things we've we've seen in a, in a very, very long time. And like you like you said, Alice, medicine is, is more reactive than anything else. So let's have, instead of having this giant push for exercise, better nutrition, healthy eating, all that stuff to preventing disease and chronic disease and even ac acute disease, acute causes, um, we push for another reactive thing, which is which is like the vaccine for the most part. It's not uh, it's not empowering the person and saying, hey, eat healthy, exercise, and it's not only going to prevent you from getting this. It might prevent you from getting these chronic long-term diseases. And now we kind of slapped another Band-Aid almost, you, you could say, on, on society. I think so. And I think with all of those things, I think people get frustrated when they're told eat eat healthy and exercise when they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. They live in um, food deserts or you tell them to exercise and they can't afford a gym membership and it's unsafe to live, you know, to exercise outdoors. And then they, you know, it's very, um, lots of traffic. It's not safe cars and traffic. So I think they get frustrated with, you know, I want, cause I think everybody wants to be healthy, but sometimes barriers get in the way. So like there's the word that we use in healthcare, we use the word non-compliance. I really dislike that word because I hear people say, oh, he's non-compliant with his medications. I like to use the word non-adherence until I have learned that uh, what's the cause for this person not sticking to their the, the regimen. Maybe they couldn't afford it. They didn't, you know, they're elderly and didn't have a ride to the pharmacy and their, their pharmacy doesn't, you know, deliver, they can't have prescriptions delivered to their home or you know, whatever the case may be, until we really, un unless you really can assess that the patient fully understands what the medication is, has all of the abilities and no obstacles to the medication and knowingly then decides not to take it, then call someone non-compliant. But, mm -hmm. you know, just to throw that word out there without assessing, I think also is one of the things that also contributes to mistrust with the healthcare community because people feel written off when, you know, there's not truly an assessment of their situation. And, Here's the thing. I know we are really busy. We are really, really busy. And sometimes it feels like we don't have the time to do those things and we're off to the next patient. But then that makes the consumer, the patient feel like, well, I'm not listened to. They don't care. They just want to push this pill and push this medication. What's in it anyways? No one's really explained it. And so I think, again, we're in this kind of this hamster wheel of things. And if we don't have trust from the community, then they're not going to want to listen to us. But, you know, they're not going to listen to us unless we ask, you know, unless we feel, unless they feel like we're truly vested mm -hmm. um, and, sin and sincere about caring about their health and well-being. Yeah, the communication and the conversation you have with your patients is just as important as you giving the, the, the medication them, themselves, just as important. I learned that early on in, in nursing school. I was at a clinical in, in Joliet. Uh, it's like a, um, not the not the best city in, in Illinois. And uh, this nurse told me that he's not complying with his medications. And then in nursing school, it happened to be that lecture about figuring out not, about non-compliance. So I took a little bit of that theory and I asked him, hey, why don't you take a medication? And we found out that he wasn't going to dialysis because he had no ride. He wasn't getting his medications because he couldn't afford it and because it was giving him side effects. That, that nobody asked him because like you said, sometimes nurses get busy and they, they forget these small basic basic details that give you a bigger, a bigger picture of what's actually going on. Right. I think health literacy plays a role in there too, because we're so used to lingo and the language, we know it inside and out that once we say something and because they're usually in a, well, I work with adults. So for the most part, oh, they're adults, you know, you know, I don't want to insult their intelligence. People, we think that people understand the truth of the matter is they could be PhD or Harvard educated uh, as an engineer, but may not understand the health lingo that we use. So I think health literacy um, and cultural uh, cultural, being culturally competent, culturally and linguistically competent also play a role in this too, because, you know, the United States is such a melting pot. We have people from all different nationalities, speak all different types of language. And I think it's really important when we talk about individualizing a, a patient's plan of care, that's literally what it means. So if we're individualizing it, that means everyone's plan is very specific to them. 
And I think we have these canned programs or these canned education pamphlets, which are helpful, right? But I think just because you give someone a pamphlet or you kind of say the spiel that's on your discharge paperwork doesn't necessarily mean that they understand it. Mm. And so, um, Especially yeah. when you have another patient from the ER that's coming up in 20 minutes. Mm. So they better sign the pamphlet and their ambulance is coming in half an hour. And that creates... We have to almost change our business model yeah. too, as a healthcare system, to create opportunity for exa- everything we're talking about on the show. Yeah, we try to almost just put a protocol for every single little thing. We have a we try to like protocol everything that happens in the hospital. We put in a protocol. Everything that the one nurse did wrong, now we have to change because our our numbers aren't aren't good. So now we gotta make a, another protocol. And you make so much of these of these protocols where you're taking the individual individuality out of the individual. We're all we're all different. Yeah. I understand that when you break your arm, it's similar to the same way I break my arm. You gotta gotta put a cast on it, but that's not how it is for everything. And you can't just put everybody into a protocol, ship them from from place to place, expecting that this person knows just as much as as the next person. It's not how it exactly. works. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but that's what they, you know. It's the, easy. The, you know. <laughs> it's easy, right? It's easy, but it definitely doesn't help us with getting to the root of the problem. Mm. Um, and we're hearing, you know, the, the public now with social media, with everybody has a platform to say something, like people are being more boisterous. They have, you know, there's internet, they can look up things, they can compare things. So, you know, our, our consumer, our patients, they're, they're starting to become more knowledgeable. Now, some of that stuff is misinformation too, so it's misguided, but they're getting information, whether it's wrong or right. Um, and they're, you know, they're wanting to see changes in the healthcare system. So I think as of lately, the healthcare system, the health healthcare in general has been under a lot of scrutiny because of, um, I mean, everything's in the news. Everything from you hear about practice issues with like Redonda, you hear, you know, vaccine issues, you see phar- pharmaceutical companies, you know, trying to lead conversations and, you know, lead the narrative when that's not historically how it's been. There's a process and a protocol for everything, but things are changing. Things are changing. And I think we as nurses, we definitely have to be kind of on deck for all those changes because as a largest segment of the healthcare workforce, people look to us, they trust us. Right. And so um, it could be demanding on us to stay current with all of the, the politics and everything that's happening in healthcare, because whether we like it to believe it or not, you might say, oh, I work, I'm just going to work my unit and, you know, I don't really care about politics. Well, you got to care about politics because it's impacting our patients. Everything from, you know, the new legislation on women's reproductive rights to pharmaceutical companies, um, you know, saying now we want a third or a fourth booster, like all of these things. The public's expecting for us to be familiar with this so we can, you know, so they can talk to us about mm-hmm. them. So how should a new nurse empower themselves going into nursing in 2022? So first off, I want to encourage people who are entering to nursing to not, to not be discouraged at all. I know there's lots of stuff out there, but um, we definitely need new nurses. We need new eyes, ears, new leaders, uh, new people at the bedside to help champion change. Um, We want all of their fresh ideas and their energy at the, at the bedside and at the table so if you're a new nurse getting ready to go into nursing, I would say the, you know, one of the things is to first brace yourself. Brace yourself. I want people to take care of themselves because I think nursing, we are a profession that we care for others. We're so busy taking care of others, we don't take care of ourselves. So first, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Um, then, you know, our, I think it's important for them to also, you got to find, you have to find time to make sure that you are um, staying abreast on what's going on in your profession. So um, be careful with social media and the sound bites, because just as the public was highly misinformed about, um, not everyone, but much of the public was highly misinformed about the COVID vaccine, same, same thing can happen if you're just getting your information from social media um, or sound bites. Um, there are a lot of things that are important to our profession. And I know you're like, well, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get my first job Mm -hmm. and take care of patients. And fortunately, unfortunately, um, new nurses are taking on a lot more than what us older heads did. We didn't have all of these politics and issues. Um, so it is demanding, um, but pace yourself and get a good mentor, get a good mentor and a support group because, 
nursing has become very extremely stressful and it's really important that you have someone like a sounding board to kind of bounce some ideas off in a group where you guys can talk about you know important issues impacting the profession and also making sure that you're taking care of yourself yeah 100 percent. because as a nurse you are the support system for the patient so you can't forget that you also need need support yourself it's very important probably the the, the that's probably the, the biggest thing i've learned in all of my uh years nursing here is you gotta learn to care about yourself because we're so like you said we're so good at caring for others but yet we always forget about ourselves unfortunately Right. I also think that people should really have a mentor. Now, I know jobs will get you'll get a preceptor or they might, as, quote unquote, assign a mentor to you in these residency programs. But I'm of the philosophy that you choose a mentor. A mentor doesn't get assigned to you. You know, find someone in, in the profession who you admire. Um, maybe they're a little further along than you are. Or they're working in a unit that you want to work in. But, you know, network. Mm -hmm. This is the time to network. You have social media. It's easy to slide in someone's DM, send them a a tweet, Facebook, whatever, whatever social media platforms, TikTok, whatever, but, you know, connect with someone and find a mentor because I think that is extremely helpful. And I think people are more willing to mentor than people know. Um, I've had people ask me to mentor them. I'm like, sure, absolutely. And it's just like, they're like, oh my gosh, I thought you were going to say no. Well, why? Why would I say no? I think it only makes um, the profession stronger. And, you know, if I have all of this information in my head, it does no good if I don't share it with someone else and bring someone else along with me. I'm going to do a shameless plug right here. If anyone needs a mentor, Matt's out here <laughs> mentoring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll do some shout outs for you guys. But yeah, it's very important. Like, like you said, you have to click with your mentor and it shouldn't just be given yeah. to you. I know when I used to interview uh, nurses back when I used to work in Chicago, uh, like our new grads for, for new, new hires, I would, I'd always ask them these little questions so I could figure out their personality so that I would kind of have an idea of who I think they would uh, orientate well with. Because... In a, I used to do cardiac too. And the, the cardiac ICU, you have a lot of people. You have, if, in the place I worked, it was just like a, all sorts of different people. There was like these, some dudes that were real strict, on point all the time. And then we had these nurses that are still very smart, but they're more lax. But they do just as, as good of a job. So you got to kind of figure out where this, this person is going to go to. Because if you have like a person that's coming in with like a very, very bubbly personality, I'm not going to put them uh, with the guy that's very strict, on point, doesn't really talk much, and just goes in like a military man. You know, I'm going to put them more with somebody that they could, you know, click with, have a good time and actually learn the best, not feel stressed that maybe they're not doing a good job because the, the guy that they're orientating with didn't say that they did a good job. You know, so you got to, it's very important. I'm glad you mentioned that. That is so important. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that that can make a big difference as to whether someone quits a job or not. I remember there was, I was orienting at one place, my day preceptor, her name was Lisa, loved her to death. She was amazing. And then when I switched over to nights, I swear it was a wicked witch of the West, East and South. Like she was, a, she was just like, oh my gosh. She like, if each or young had a face, it was her. Yeah. And literally every night I would go to work. I'm like, I don't even want to work here. I don't even know if I want to be a nurse. Cause I felt like I couldn't get anything right. We just were not vibing. We were not on the same page. Her humor was dark and just, I don't know. We, it just was not a good fit at all. And so um, fortunately I was able to talk to my day preceptor. She asked me how things were going and I, you know, explained how things were going and they were kind of politely able to then get me another preceptor without abandoning my first one. I just, but she then became like my, my backup preceptor and I got another preceptor, but that really made a difference. Cause I was like this close to like, screw this job. Mm -hmm. I don't need it. I will go work somewhere else. I don't need this drama in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I hated nursing because of that that particular preceptor. That, that goes back to your first point in the beginning of the podcast where it's okay to try different units, different hospitals, go out there and grow because just because one unit sucked, you now you have a bad perception of nursing or why it sucks or this is happening. Go switch it up. It does not hurt. And that's why always we both vouch for travel nursing because of how much growth you have trying different mm -hmm. units. But Alice, what are some challenges that you have uh, came across recently, that you have the biggest challenges that, that you have taken on? Oh, the biggest challenge of what I've taken on. Well, that's interesting um, because I mentioned earlier, and again, I've been, I've been a nurse for 25, nearly 25 years now. So I've, I've worn many hats, ER, ICU, cardiology. Those are like my passions, my love, my stomping ground. But I'm also like every, many nurses, I've moonlighted, right? I've worked in corrections. I've done a little home health, done some travel. I've done a little bit of everything. And one of my um, most recent, 
I'll say most recent, but one of the other hats that I wear is as a health contributor on television. It's not something where you see a lot of nurses doing. Um, and so one of the, one of the beautiful things about that is I, I literally legit consider it patient education, just using a different platform. Like many of the questions that your patients have about medications, treatments, and what should I do to stay healthy and other things that they wanted to ask me about heart failure, I can educate them about that. Now I get to do um, similar education and other things on a different platform. And so just recently, um, I was asked to be a part of a, I guess, um, let me back up and say, I think it's really important that nurses get to drive conversations and be experts. So I'm really honored that I get, get to do that. And I would love to see more nurses doing that. Historically, it's been a lot of physicians, right, do, doing those things. But I also think that nurses um, should consider media as a, as a specialty. It's, it's something that's not as popular. I understand it's not, I'm not telling everyone to leave the bedside or anything, but I'm in your growing of trying things. I think that's an opportunity. But one of the challenges I just recently faced was Try like jumping, jumping into another aspect of that. So long, Hollywood has not always favored. They've not always favorably. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They've not always shown the nurse in a really strong, positive light. Um, you've seen Hollywood, how like Nurse Ratchet, and like we're we're kind of like more of a sidekick. And I was like, well, doctor, what do you want me to do? Type of thing. And so there's actually a medical scripted show that is in the works and the lead character is a nurse. Mm -hmm. So um, there's an opportunity for me to be a consultant on that show, but it's really gonna pull me away from some of my direct patient care. So I'm in a situation like that where I'm, I'm that's one of the most challenging things I'm going to, that I'll have to decide because, you know, when you're really passionate and good at, in a, within a certain specialty, how do you know when it's time to move on or try something new? And I think, you know, I've, been, I've met many nurses who struggle with that. It's like, oh, I love, you know, cardiac and everything, but I want to try labor and delivery. So what are, you know, it's kind of hard to decide, but one of the beautiful things about nursing is you can always come back. There's so many different things that you can do, but you can always come back. But um, that is a road that's less traveled by nurses. So um I just don't want to mess it up, y'all. <laughs> I, I think you should pave that path. Um, just like you said, it seems like you have a passion that you're trying to get after, and nursing isn't your full identity like we always talk about. It's a part of it. So, yeah, go ahead and leave that. Go pursue it. Go take that spaceship wherever it you know, um, takes off. And if it doesn't end up, you always have that backbone, just like you said. That's the beautiful part of nursing. It's always there waiting for you. Well, that's and that's good that you say that because some nurses feel guilty um, and sometimes people, you know, they move around like, so let me say, well, obviously during the pandemic, we had a lot of nurses who were stressed out, um, needed a break from the bedside or were just so overworked, overwhelmed and underappreciated. They're like, screw this. I'm going to go do something else, but they never stopped being a nurse. So I think the, you know, what is that? Assess, diagnose, plan, intervention, evaluation, our, our nursing process can be used in literally any aspect of life in any realm of business and finance, education, entrepreneurship like you literally legit once you are a nurse there's a, a way of thinking um that you can take to any aspect of of life and apply that just because you uh leave the bedside whether it's permanent or it's temporarily or it's because you had a medical condition or you have to be off whatever the reason is there's always something else you can do and it doesn't make you any less of a nurse i'm glad you brought that on the ad pie yeah it's acronym yes. because i used yeah because when i finished finished school when we used to start, um, when we we're first doing our blogs, I used to use AdPi a lot. I used to use it for like daily things. Like when I ever ha I had a problem, I use basically use, use AdPi, and I stopped using it. But now I'm glad you, I'm glad you reminded me because that, that that's what we could kind of use to our business too. Just use AdPi. It's a great critical yeah. thinking tool. Mm -hmm. It is. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone else uses AdPi. It's just nursing. I think it's just nursing. Honestly, before the show, I forgot the whole process. I'm glad you just gave me a whole nursing school refresh there about that. <laughs> yeah, so, I'm. I can't get it out of my head. I'm um, always looking. I'm always thinking like, "Adipo, okay, assess, diagnose." And literally, if we approach a lot of problems in life using that, the nursing process, mm -hmm. we can make this world a a, a lot better place. We just got to nurses. We just got to collectively come together. And I think just a lot of things have been happening that have you know, cause a little friction and divide amongst the profession or, you know, we're being distracted from direct 
actual patient care because of other things that are going on around us. Mm. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the Redonda case? So that was a very interesting case. And I'll be honest, I wasn't familiar with it when it first happened. Um, I wasn't. Um, and so I, you know, kind of just caught wind of it this last, um, last several months. And so when I first heard of the case, I wanted to know what was going on. So I, like there are CMS reports and some other summaries that were online. And I was, I'll be honest, I don't know if many nurses read the, the report because I don't think that was something that was just floating around on social media. However, when I read it, I was actually, I cringed a little bit. I'm like, Ugh, some red flags. what's happening? What, you know, what do we, what, what happened? And, but you know, it's, I'm, I, that's very difficult. So I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not redonda. I can't really say what it was like to be in her shoes, but I do know that the environment that we work in doesn't make it any easier. And if anything, only exacerbates the problem. And let me just kind of di dissect, unpack this a little bit. You guys correct me if I'm wrong, but redonda, by the time she was working at vendor built, mm -hmm. um, is that vendor? It's Vanderbilt, yeah. right? That's mm -hmm. it. Um, she'd, She'd worked there for two years. Prior to that, there was like six months, but she worked somewhere else before she went there. So I'm going to say two years of acute care experience. She worked in the neuro ICU progressive care area. I'm not really sure what her orientation or onboarding or like, um, but it sounds like that that particular day, she was also kind of like the resource nurse, the the help the helper nurse, and she had a preceptor, uh, or preceptor. She was precepting on top of that. And then in... Also, I guess they were having some issue, communication issues between the, the electronic health record and their scanning system. So like there were so many systems in here, so many things set up like booby traps left, and right, left, and right all over the place. And so I think Redonda in her pursuit to just kind of just get things done, because that's what nurses are. We're doers. We get it done. You know, you know us. We can find a workaround. We can jerry-rig some stuff to get it done. Right. But I think this is one of those times where our willingness to get things done kind of got in our way. And what I, the lesson that I pulled away from this and I tell nurses is, you know what, in the interest of safety, in the interest of doing what's right, because when you do what's right, right things will happen. When you do something wrong, wrong things will happen. Sometimes we got to slow things down and bottleneck the system so the higher ups can see it impacted in their output, their volume and their dollars. That's the only way you really get healthcare hospitals administrators to move is by impacting the bottom dollar. So by slowing, but to get back to Redonda, I think it was a very unfortunate situation. Um, I think her willingness to want to help, help the unit, help everyone get things done, really put her in a situation where she, she made a mistake. She made an error. Um, and to be criminally charged, I will say this in my experience and having been a patient safety manager for a short period of time, most nurses think, oh, the hospital is going to cover me. Why didn't, the, why didn't Vanderbilt cover Redonda? Well, it's in the fine print when you guys sign on. As long as you operate within standards of procedures and protocol and policy, you will be covered. The minute you deviate from that, you are no longer covered. But of course, when mistakes and errors happen, it's usually because there's a deviation. So once she deviated out of that, the hospital was like, well, kind of hands off. And they didn't, I don't believe they did the best thing either. But it was a really unfortunate situation, it got into the criminal system. But I'll say this, the court of public opinion does not match our legal system. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at her charges, um, what were her charges? Her charges were some form of... Criminal negligence, homicide, and abuse of an impaired adult. Okay, so now I love my nurses. Let me just say that. But if we... Take out the, we're not in the court of public opinion, right? Because we're already upset and charge everything. That's what the court of public opinion will say. But in the, the legal system, if you look at the definitions of those charges, and even with what she admitted to, per the judicial system, she was rightfully charged. It sucks. Mm. It sucks because she didn't mean to do those things. And she, it's like she was booby trapped. She was set up. Um, so it's unfortunate. Um, I know she was um sentenced last what was that last friday was that friday no it was friday right yes she got her sentencing i actually watched it it took forever um it took a it was a long time um and so i think she's you know she's been through enough she's already been charged with what she's been charged with um you know it's fortunate she didn't have she didn't go to jail because 
I don't really, I don't necessarily believe that she needed, she didn't need to go to jail. She made a mistake. Yeah. She made a mistake. But again, in the judicial system, in the court of law, those standards, those laws are very, um, are very strict mm-hmm. to letter of the law. And so the court of public opinion, they don't understand health care. They don't understand what we go through. And so I think it was just a real big mismatch. Mm-hmm. So I'm not really sure how I feel about it, to be honest. It's just, I, I just want us to learn from it so no one else finds themselves in that type of situation again. Definitely. And it's creating a lot of psychological insecurity for nurses where they don't feel safe in their own mm-hmm. workplace environment. And that's what creates a healthy workplace environment that ultimately the patient feels safe and mm-hmm. then they have a better experience. And we're neglecting that one single part that, in her case, didn't set her up for success. Mm-hmm. The environment set her up for failure from the start. Nurses are definitely right. going to be a lot scared to, to provide body care because this is this is the the first ruling of this kind you, you could say for the most part and like with all other first rulings everything else that's going to move forward from here that's similar to the situation it's going to get based on whatever happened in, in this court case so now you can make a mis- mistake that's maybe not as uh, you could say intense as as her was but you could now maybe still get charged with whatever she was charged with because that's Someone that someone has been charged in the past for, and, and with law, that's how it works, unfortunately. So it's going to be a tough situation. Yeah, and so it, it's going to be a very tough situation. And so I hope this this was like like all the alarms are sounding off everywhere, and everybody's unit and everybody's clinic to like, okay, what's going on here? We're not going to do that because we don't want to find ourselves in a similar situation. So uh, very very unfortunate thing to happen. If if I could find a silver lining in any of this, I'm hopeful that it's now systems are looking at how to prevent these things from happening because i'll say this the, and I, you know i not, i don't know that many people, many people know that i went into nursing because my dad died of a massive heart attack i said i want to be the best cardiac nurse in the world what they do not know and that i've, I've only started to share recently because of redonda's case is that my dad had insurance uh it was a hospital that where um some of what led to his ultimate, you know, dying from this massive heart attack is because he didn't get the surveillance and the treatment or the attention that he needed. You know, it was really small community hospital kind of, you know, and I hate to even use this analogy. We've heard of stories where, oh, the patient died in the ER because people were either so busy or they were non-complacent or they just didn't care about the patients that were waiting. I'm not saying that's what Redonda's case, but what I'm saying is because of my personal experience, I'm very hyper vigilant when it comes to practice and doing what's right. Nurses, I know we want to get the job done, but we can't cut corners. We can't cut corners. And when we look at uh, something as serious as patient death, now if someone goes in for surgery, it's like, okay, the risk of benefits are that death might be a, a risk of that, but death is not a risk of going to get a PET scan. So I know that might seem very like a very two things and you're like, oh, is it? You know, it doesn't really sound good to hear, but I think we can't ignore the elephant that's now in the room. We as nurses need to make sure that we are demanding that our health, our work environment sets us up for success and that systems are in place. And so when something's not right, something's not there, we need to pump our brakes and and kind of uh, bottleneck the system because we want to do what's right instead of just working around stuff to make things happen because that that particular behavior doesn't demonstrate to the organization that I need help, I need resources because I'm still being productive. Um, but even if you're being productive, you know, hopefully that these type of things don't ever happen again. But we because we don't want them to happen again, we have to be aware of it. So I said that to say that nurses be very very careful with what you're doing. Demand an environment where you're your organization is providing you the things that you want because this has happened already. And so there's definitely precedence for, you know, subsequent cases to come along. And I don't think anyone wants to, and I know no one wants to be in a situation like Redonda trying to do good, trying to help the unit, trying to be there for all the patients and then cause patient harm. I agree with you. That was a lovely way to put it. We need to empower ourselves ultimately and not, take anything from management doctors and stand up for what's right and i love what's happening in the space of nursing we're all growing together communities podcasting and we're finally Mm -hmm. addressing the elephant in room just like you said so hopefully as healthcare changes fingers crossed we can change as well with Mm -hmm. it and create impactful change 
Yeah. I think nurses can lead the change. I think yes. we are the change agents. I mean, we're the largest segment of the healthcare workforce. If we all just rally together and just made, you know, did something or stood up for something all collectively at the same time, they'd have to listen to us. And especially in hospitals, because hospitals only exist because nurses are there. Surgeons can come in and do all the surgery they want. They could do whatever. But if there's no one there to provide that 24 hour care for the patient, hospitals would not exist. Right. No, there'd be no support for them. Yeah. And that's the big thing nurses, has, nurses have to realize that, that that's how the system is. Like we, we are the backbone of it and we could, we should be able to lead, lead the change and we could. It's just, I feel like nurses get put down a lot. They don't, like you said in the beginning, we don't get much credibility. It's always more of the doctor. And then hospitals know that nurses are the highest cost in a hospital versus physicians. They're the ones that actually bring, bring in the money. So we always, we're always almost like uh, subconsciously belittled by management, by all this other thing, like slightly, just just so we don't we don't notice it. And then they give us food if, if something something happens, and then it's, yeah. it's a constant thing. But but they just keep us, they just keep us, they just sustain us. That's it. They just do the right. bare minimum that they have to just to keep us satisfied, just so we don't kind of rebel or anything like that. Right. I need more than pizza and tacos mm. and some coffee. I need to free be health happy insurance. And work. <laughs> yes. Right. I, I need to not be overworked. I need to have the yeah. resources in place. I need my equipment to work. Yeah. Okay. Like, and don't be adding those extra, like with computer charting. I hate this. They will, oh, we have this and we have that, but then there's extra clicks. Mm -hmm. And with each and every click that you add, you increase the opportunity for an error to occur. So yeah. I, you know, I want nurses to really be a part of that and kind of, we got to take back our power. Mm. We got to take back our power and run hospital systems. I think I've, I've joked about this, but I, it's really not a joke. I can't wait until there are, you know, a nurse led hospitals that really mm. nurses are in every office making all the decisions and calling all the shots. I'm glad about that. Let's make because, it happen. Yeah. Cause in Texas we were talking to the, the, uh, was the, the nurse practitioner that was there. I, f I forgot her name, the younger one. Yeah. She actually said that there should be hospitals that are, that are nursing run because as a nurse, you basically know where the issues are. And every time an issue arises, guess what? It's it's an, it's an issue with the nurse. And then we got to fix the issue with a protocol that the nurse has has to now do. So nurses probably do a very good job running hospitals if they got the chance to do it. I, I think so. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously I do work with physicians and, you know, I work with some great physicians and I've worked with some not so great mm -hmm. physicians too. But historically, physicians don't good, do aren't great at communication amongst each other. Nephro is over here. <laughs> Cards is over here. You know, like nobody is talking to anyone. It's usually the nurse that plays the, you know, that brings everyone together. Like, okay, guys, what's the plan? What's going on? And we're the ones communicating. Well, pulmonology says this, cardiology said he's not ready to go home. And like, we're fielding all this information. So we're the ones that are talking to everyone. And so I think that even better, it would be for us to leave these hospitals. Now, I believe there are some skill sets that we need to add to this. Mm. So that skill set of like finance and business, because that's not a focus in nursing school, at least not initial. Maybe if you go on for like a, a more of a business or leadership model, you get that. And I think that's one of all of our downfalls. We got to make sure that um, that we're training and educating our nurses to not just kind of shove, the, you know, uh, herd them to the bedside, but herd them to be leaders. Let's run these facilities, not just, you know, stand by and just do this part. No, we, you know, I want to empower us to really take charge of healthcare because we know what's going on. I love the empowerment. So one, yeah. one last question we like to ask all of our guests. So if you had the opportunity to have coffee one last time with anybody, who would it be and why? Ooh, coffee. Um, Dr. Fauci. Mm. So I actually had got a chance to do an interview with Dr. Fauci um, midway through the pandemic and kind of ask him some questions about, you know, what was going on with the pandemic? What were, this was before vaccines were approved. Um, what's coming down the pipeline and all of these other things and about, you know, how things were being rolled out, where the money was going and testing and all of these things. And I believe, you know, I know Dr. Fauci is a, a, a very accomplished um, infectious disease physician. He's done a lot of work, was very, was, did a lot of work around the HIV pandemic and all of these other things. But I would want to sit down and talk with him really about what happened, what's going on in the White House? Like, <laughs> what, are they allowing you to really exercise and use your knowledge as uh, as a doctor to really take care of this nation. How much of this is driven by politics mm. and 
because you know we see pal we and we've seen on the on movies and stuff I, I think some of that stuff's real how they kind of wheel and deal like well i'll vote your legislation if you do this for me and type of thing i really want to know if any of that really impact is um how much of autonomy does he have in the position that he's in when it comes to um him and, um with guiding our nation when it comes to healthcare, because we saw we saw Pfizer and um, Moderna and Johnson Johnson like releasing statements before the CDC and before FDA could even get a look at these things. And I'm like, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. So I would just love to sit down with with Dr. Fauci and to learn more about that because, and I think in my in my nursing pursuits um, and the thing I've been a part of like um, uh, AACN, the American Nurses. Um, American American Critical Care Nurses Association, American Nurses Asso Nurses Association. So I've learned, picked up on a lot of leadership skills and opportunities. And I think one of the ways that nurses will be able to run hospitals is we, is we kind of have to understand the politics. So to answer your question, I would sit down with Dr. Fauci and ask him, what are the politics when it comes to government and healthcare? Yeah. Okay. Because I think governments kind of. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like they're 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 meaning well and doing well because they do. They're a big payer when it comes to Medicaid and Medicare and stuff like that. But how much, how much are they also getting in the way? Mm -hmm. I think after that cup of coffee, you can be a real nurse leader and run the hospital for sure. <laughs> I'm gonna run the nation. Yeah. That <laughs> right. Yeah. If only we knew. You know. Yeah. It's a really good question. Yeah. yeah. Alice, where can people find you? I have a website, asknursealice.com. So you can go there and tons of information about what I'm working on, what's going on, and some health and practice information. I also have a podcast too, it's Ask Nurse Alice Podcast, which Ask Nurse Alice Podcast, which puts out an episode every week. And I'm on all things social, Ask Nurse Alice. So I make it really simple and easy uh, to follow um, and engage with me. And then, you know, if you got, if I'm always, you know, I'm in my DMs. So if people want to send me a message, I'm responsive. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alice, for your time. Really appreciate it. Lovely talking to you. Thank you for having me, guys.